Hey everyone, this is Casey Ellis. I'm founder, chair, and CTO of BugCrowd, and welcome to today's Security Flash. Hi, I'm Adam, from, uh, an application security engineer over here at BugCrowd. I also go under Evil Damon on my social media. Very cool. So Adam, uh, there's been a vulnerability today that's come out, today being uh, North American time. You know, something that kind of dropped this morning has, has dominated, I think, some of the conversations that have gone on in, in Voln research and Voln management land throughout the day. It sounds and looks and smells enough like Log4Shell uh, and, and some of the stuff that we saw with Log4J uh, at the end of last year, that um, it's, it's kind of triggered a little bit of you know, vulnerability PTSD uh, in, in the Twitters and across different folks. So you, know, you and I talked about it, we wanted to get on and kind of distinguish and actually explain what's happening with this particular bug, explain how it's different, but then talk about what the actual risks associated with this vulnerability are and you know, how people need to be thinking about it going forward. So. You know, take it away. What are, we, what are we dealing with? So this is a set of vulnerabilities. And the problem is there's a huge amount of miscommunication because they're very similar, but it's two separate vulnerabilities. One that's been coined Spring for Shell. Um, I believe Cyber Kendra called it that. Um, and that's kind of led off to what everyone's calling it now. Um, that one doesn't have a CVE at the moment. It's at, at this moment, I should say, because for some reason, it seems like people are saying that it's not a vulnerability, but it actually is. There's a huge amount of confusion about it. Even now, while we're recording, there's debate on Twitter, probably running well beyond anyone wants to read. Yeah, and as just on that, um, so this is the one where some of the folk that are involved in, in the affected software itself are saying, no, this is a security design thing that we made it deliberate decision about, you know, a number of years ago. Um, so is it is it a design flaw or a design any pattern or, or is it an actual vulnerability that we're dealing with here, do you think? Well, from what we can tell, it's a bypass of a 12 year old CVE. So it goes back to 2010, it's existed there for a while. The developers have tossed up saying that it isn't a vulnerability. People have shown that it actually is vulnerable. The big thing here is that it's requires a couple of weird preconditions that aren't going to match everyone. But I think in a bunch of enterprise environments, you're probably going to find it's configured that way. Right. Cool. So uh, do you want to talk about the second one? The other one actually has a CVE. So this is 2022-22963. It's a much more boring name than log for spring or spring for shell. Um, Basically, it's a deserialization that could achieve remote code execution. Basically, if you could send it this random string in a post request, you could get it to interpret that and in the right conditions, execute code on that system. You probably don't want to be executing code on someone else's system, well, no. depending on who you are. <laughs> Sometimes you do, but maybe that's not what the person who owns that system wants. Yeah, definitely. So we've got Spring for Shell, no CVE. That's the one that has caused some, some confusion and some back and forth. Um, you've got, you know, I, I think what you and I referred to as Spring Cloud function uh, in, in the conversations beforehand, which is the one with the CVE that's not actually like named in the same way out there on the internet just yet. Two vulnerabilities, both in Spring, as I understand it, neither of them are Log4Shell or affect Log4J. They're completely different in, in that sense, but they are both involving Java. They are both you know, or they, they, they've been kind of caught up in branding it in a similar way to the uh, to the exploits that happened around Log4J at the end of last year with the use of four shell in, in the name. Would that be a fair way to sum it up? Yeah, and the other thing is Spring, it's a framework. It's basically what you use to design a good looking front end for your Java applications on the web, which means this is used a lot. It's yeah. very common to find and you're probably going to find it probably running around in anywhere that's got Java, at least modern applications these days. Yeah, most at the moment, the, go ahead. Yeah, Sorry. at the moment, we have not seen any really popular pushing of these vulnerabilities, but I think we're going to see that ramp up in the next couple of days. Yeah, I was going to ask, um, I think we had the same thought at the same time there. So in terms of, you know, with, with Log4J and Log4Shell, all that stuff, the minute it dropped, you know, we saw a, a ton of activity ramp up. Uh, on, on the bug crowd platform and, and looking back historically, we'd seen bits of it um, prior to that as well. You know, what are you all seeing at this point in time? Like with all of the news and conversation today, have we seen that ramp yet or not so much? We haven't seen that ramp come up immediately yet. We're going to most likely see it coming soon, especially with these vulnerabilities being more and more popular. 
The big part is that the moment it pops up publicly, let's say someone says, hey, I found this cool vulnerability, forgets to redact a little bit of it, and then someone figures out from there, puts it on some template system, it's likely that this is just going to roll through a bunch of systems very rapidly. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a thing called, for the, for the listeners, if you haven't looked up HD Moore's law, I think it was coined by Josh Corman, um, talking about you know the the ability of an attacker basically being proportional to whatever's in Metasploit at that point in time. That's kind of what we're talking about there. Once uh, a vulnerability like this is successfully weaponized, and then that weaponized version is made available to a broader group of people, all of a sudden you see a far more diverse array of, of threat actors you know, potentially using it. And you know the other thing that happens, obviously, is that the the white hats that are trying to help discover this so it could be fixed before something bad happens, they actually use oftentimes similar knowledge uh, to, to do their detection work and so on. Yeah, and that's exactly it. We're going to see bug hunters use this rapidly as well, which is what we want to see. Yeah, We want to see these bug hunters finding these vulnerabilities before they're rapidly exploited by other people. Yeah, for sure. So just just in general there, I, I think you've, you've touched on an important point. And one of the differences, I guess, you know, going back to the whole, hey, everyone, like, relax, it's not log for shell, a redux of that, but it definitely is cause for concern. Um, one of the differences is the uh, the actual payload for log for shell, you could fit it in a tweet. Like you didn't even need to build a Metasploit module. There was, I think, you know, kind of a grab and go kind of aspect to uh, to exploitation of that particular issue that contributed to contributed to it being such a big issue across the internet. And from what you're saying, it sounds like this one is quite a bit more complicated to exploit. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, so this requires some understanding of what's called class loader manipulation, yep. which is a fancy thing in Java where you can bring in data from a separate object to make it run on this part of the app. And a lot of people don't understand Java at the best of times, let alone now, um, trying to figure out how some random app works with this one vulnerability. And I think that's what we're going to see next. We're going to see that rapid change once that first set of vulnerabilities where someone builds out a good framework for getting this bug. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I tried hard not to laugh at the Java joke there because you know, obviously a lot of people use it, but as a language, it definitely does a lot of stuff. And some of those things aren't necessarily all that intuitive. So I get what you mean there. Um, so in terms of, you know, I guess our role, you know, you, you mentioned once there's the ability for, for, uh, proof of concept to, to be used and you know even some of the folk that might be in the crowd right now doing their own research on how to how to actually exploit this I guess two questions one is do you expect to see you know as happened with with log4j kind of where there's smoke there's fire there was continuing there was almost research clustering around you know log4j and, and particularly Jindy and all of a sudden a bunch of other stuff fell out subsequently um, do you think that's likely to happen here and then the second part is like, if you're a bug hunter, you know, what do, how can I, you know, how can I use this to, to obviously make money, to do security research, to help, you know, companies make their, their, you know, IT environments safer, so on. Well, that's going to be the first stage. They're just going to most likely, there's going to be some security researchers who already found the bug. Hmm. They've already dissected it. They found a good way to use it. We're waiting on that first initial wave to come through where people have that vulnerability available. Once it's mass. Um, developed because I'll be honest, not everyone has the skills to go through and do this immediately. Most people probably aren't that level for bug hunters. Um, there's only a few people who niche in building those high quality vulnerabilities. Um, the difference between security first? research and bug hunting in some ways is I, what I hear you getting at there. Yeah. yeah. Um, those security researchers who are really digging deep, finding these vulnerabilities, building them out into something useful are not going to be the ones who immediately find these vulnerabilities. They're going to be the ones who build the framework for bug hunters to find the vulnerabilities better. And once that starts, then we can start looking at finding those vulnerabilities and building out remediation steps. Yeah, so interesting interesting kind of thing that you're pointing out there, the difference between weaponization and skill sets involved in that part, and then you know, folks that might not necessarily understand Java, but when it comes to figuring out if something's vulnerable, um, or you know, finding assets that are in places where they shouldn't be, or whatever else. Um, if you're in that that latter bucket, you know, what do is is there anything that you can do at this point in time to even identify where 
you know, assets might be potentially vulnerable? I'll start looking at applications that are out of date. Um, remember, this is part of a Java framework, which means it's probably bundled into apps that you aren't expecting. It won't say spring framework on the front of the box, put it that way. Yeah. At the end of the day, you're gonna to have to have a look deeper into this. If you start looking at older applications, they probably have built these applications and are bringing in those apps from an older version of the software. So identifying that ahead of time will help you find those assets and go, this one will be vulnerable once we have a pay, once we have the actual exploit. Let's wait for it, sit on there. And then once you've got the exploit, they'll go through and make sure that it works. Yeah, that makes sense. So, yeah, I mean, all of what you're saying, it sounds like as a defender, I've got a window at this point in time to, to basically get ahead of this thing and, and remediate or mitigate um, ahead of, you know, potentially more kind of activity happening around this, uh, this set of vulnerabilities that we've just talked about. But, you know, as you mentioned, assuming there's some, there's likely to be more, and it really has to do with, with research actually focusing on Spring itself over the next period of time. Um, what do you recommend for, for fo folk in that position at this point? At the moment, you've got a nice window. Um, Spring for Shell doesn't have an immediate patch. You're going to have to work around a remediation, which is to basically deny list certain things. Um, if you could, you could disable data binder, which is part of the framework used for this, which will just get rid of the vulnerability for now. If you can't, you can create patterns in a deny list that will help deal with that. You can find right. all of that in the accompanying yep. notes here. If you're lucky enough um, and you're only vulnerable to the CVE Spring Cloud function vulnerability, you can patch right now. There's patches currently available. You can download them, update them, check that they match. You'll be able to do that. If you're in a situation where you're running an app that you're not sure is vulnerable, but you know that it's Java, it might be best to contact the developers and go, hey, is this vulnerable? Can you tell us? Um, and what can we do to patch it? Because most of the time you might not be the one building it. Yeah, for sure. I, I guess on top of that as well, because we're so early on into this, um, keeping an eye on whom, I mean, we'll, we'll keep updates uh, going alongside this security flash as, as new stuff comes out if and when it does um, rolling forward. Uh, so you know, coming back to this piece of content and using that as a, a source of, of information for, for what to do. We're going to actually publish a bunch of notes that Adam's actually prepared uh, to, uh, to help folk out and we'll keep those up to date as best we can. But then outside of that, it's really keeping an eye on Spring. I guess if, if you know, Spring for Shell suddenly becomes a CVE, that would imply that they're going to release a patch at some point. So all of a sudden new mitigation options become available for, for defenders at that point, right? Yeah, that's exactly it. Okay. And at the end of the day, it's just going to be that you have to spend a little bit of time looking through this. And I think is, like log for shell you're going to spend a little bit of time looking for where you can find this. Yeah. It's going to be hiding in your HR systems. It's going to be hiding in your accounting systems. You're going to have to spend time looking for it. Because the internet is built on turtles. Um, so you know, this is a, a yet another example of that. No, it's, it's, um, that's good. I think that's really important advice. You know, some of the conversations that have been going on around SBOM, um, you know, software bill of materials, software composition for bespoke and, and for products um, that are out there that, you know, include libraries like this one. It's not specifically a Spring or a Log4j issue or even a Java issue. It's the fact that, you know, code has bugs in it. Uh, and, and when that happens in a dependency that's widespread, then all of a sudden the, uh, the adversary gets wind of that and a whole bunch of weird stuff happens on the internet kind of subsequent as we experienced at the end of last year. So hopefully we get to avoid that with this one to some degree, but um, if not, hopefully uh, this has been useful in terms of preparation and understanding of what y'all are dealing with. So anything else, Adam, and we'll, we'll wrap, it, wrap it up there. I think that's about right. Um, the last thing is might be good to actually, if you are already a BugCrowd customer, have a speak to anyone uh, tied to it because it might be worth discussing, hey, can we look at getting some hunters on this early? Try and yeah. have a look and see if you can actually get people working on it ahead of time. Absolutely. I think that's a really important call out. And that's actually something, it's not, I think, that well known necessarily that we uh, we were doing that with, with Log4j. That's something that, that BugCrowd got swung in to do uh, fairly quickly as that whole thing unfolded. You know, this idea of like, where is this thing? 
you know, how do we make sure that we've got as much of it dealt with as possible, or we at least know where it is um, so that we can mitigate the risk in, in other ways. That is a, a way that we've been able to deploy the crowd quite successfully into that use case. Um, we've done it prior, and in this case, we can do it again. So that's a good shout out. Outside of that, I think uh, that pretty much covers it. We'll update you as we get any new information as well and should be good to go. All righty. Well, thank you, Adam. Thanks, everyone, for joining the Security Flash. Feel free to reach out. We're at Bug Crowd uh, on Twitter, um, you know, sales at bugcrowd.com. I'm Casey John Ellis on Twitter, Evil Damon. Thank you very much, Adam. Really appreciate it. No problem. See you later. <laughs>